Howdy readers, I'm Jason, this is Chapter and Verse, and this is the latest video in my Cromwellathon project, uh, in which myself and lots of other booktubers, uh, people with channels and people without channels, are um, reading our way once again through Hilary Mantel's uh, Thomas Cromwell novels in anticipation of the publication of The Mirror and the Light next month. So, for this week, uh, we read the third chapter in Bring Up the Bodies, uh, which is called Angels. And uh, before I get into um, the couple of things I want to say uh, about this chapter, um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, apologize for getting this video up later than uh, I expected to. I didn't have near as good a reason for being, being as tardy as I've been. Um, as Jay Shea, and Jay Shea wasn't even tardy in getting his video up, uh, but he had uh, the flu this, this last week. Uh, I did not. I had a crazy week, but I still should have been able to get my video up on time. Uh, Wednesday, I had the Skillet concert, which I told you guys about um, last week, and it was sublime. Uh, it was one of the best shows I've ever seen. It was definitely the best show I've ever seen at the Casper Event Center. The second of the opening bands, uh, From Ashes to New, were um, every bit as good as Skillet live. So uh, I've never seen an opening band that did a better job of just literally electrifying an audience and getting them ready for, for the main event. And, uh, and Skillet is completely electrifying as well live. So, uh, so that was fun. Um, but that day started, so we weren't supposed to have any snow that day, even on Tuesday night, right? The forecast said that we weren't supposed to get any snow until late Wednesday night. And, uh, and that um, turned out not to be the case. We got uh, quite a lot of snow and it was like blizzard conditions. And um, yeah, I had family who was coming up from Colorado for the concert and they got like two thirds of the way here and had to turn back because the roads were so bad. So that sucked. Um, but yeah, that morning before I walked into work, uh, I was walking over to the, to the mailbox uh, in, front of, in front of my office to mail you know, letters and bills and whatnot and uh, thought I knew where all the ice was and um, stepped on a patch of ice that was covered by this really feathery dry snow and um, fell harder than I have fallen since I was in college. Both my feet came right up off the ground. I was completely, uh, completely in the air and landed hard on my right side and uh and so banged up my shoulder and my elbow and my hip really bad and actually my right ankle too um so so that was no fun and then the very next day uh, i was so sore from that fall that i actually went home from work early and and i was so uncomfortable that i couldn't i just couldn't get i couldn't find a position in which to read on um, which i wasn't in a great deal of pain so uh, yeah, I couldn't lay down easily. I couldn't sit easily. Uh, it was it was no fun, but I did get my reading done, and uh, so I'm here to talk about angels in Bring Up the Bodies. So the first thing uh, I wanted to note here is that in this chapter, we see characters becoming um, dangerously bold, right? Like they're really flirting with crossing the line, um, you know, with with taking things a little bit too far in ways that we really haven't seen yet uh, in these books. Some examples of this uh, are when Cromwell visits Anne Boleyn um, and is talking to her about Catherine and about Mary. And Anne is proposing ways of compromising Mary. Uh, and she tells Cromwell, I'm not suggesting he bed her. God save me, I would not impose it on any friend of mine. All that is needed is to have her make a fool of herself and do it in public so she loses her reputation. No. He says, what? That is not my aim and those are not my methods. What I love about that scene, um, that moment, is um, just that simple sentence, no, he says. So much of what we see in these books are characters kind of dancing around what they mean. And, um, and here people are just becoming a lot more brazen, which I find refreshing and uh, exhilarating. And it's a little bit scary too, actually. But I love that. I mean, he's he's not uh, he's not mincing words uh, in any way, shape, or form, right there. No, he says. Um, and then on the very next page, their uh, their conversation um, continues, and it just gets more and more thrilling. 
She says, Henry will never return to Rome. He will never bow his knee. Since my coronation, there is a new England. It cannot subsist without me. Not so, madam, he thinks. If need be, I can separate you from history. He says, I hope we are not at odds. I give you homely advice as friend to friend. You know I am, or I was, the father of a family. I always did counsel my wife to calmness at such a time. If there is anything I can do for you, tell me, and I will do it. He looks up at her, his eyes glitter. But do not threaten me, good madam. I find it uncomfortable. And then she, of course, uh, follows that up with uh, a, a very a very direct, very intense, um, you know, after he's just told her, do not threaten me, um, she threatens him more intensely than she has. Um, you must study your advantage, Master Secretary. Those who are made can be unmade. And, you know, Jay Shea has talked about this passage as well. Roz and her family in their video um, talked about this passage as well. It's a real rush to read. We see these characters Again, um, pushing the envelope, seeing what they can get away with. It's, it's, it's like the game has, has moved forward enough and um, you know, the pieces are enough in place that characters don't need to be as careful as they have been in the past. Or maybe they, they do need to be as careful as they've been in the past and maybe what they're doing here is, <clears throat> um, I don't know, spelling out their own dooms, I suppose. They've gotten too comfortable. I think is what it is. But we see other examples of this as well, right? Uh, Suffolk openly suggesting that Henry is a cuckold when he bursts in, um, like he does in a, in a later scene. And um, I mean, that is, and that is bold. I mean, that causes Cromwell to essentially throw him up against the wall like they're in a you know barroom brawl or something. And in Suffolk's dialogue right there, we get um, we get a sense that uh, that Henry has been, um, again, flirting with crossing lines. Henry has turned white. Think what you are saying. He approaches Brandon as if he might knock him down, which if he had a pole axe, he could. My wife is carrying a child. I am lawfully married. Oh, Charles blows out his cheeks. Yes, as far as that goes. But I thought you said, um, and then Cromwell right, hurls himself at, at Suffolk, uh, cuts him off right there. But again, but I thought you said, so that suggests that Henry has been speaking speaking about putting Anne to the side somehow. And he has been speaking about this with really recklessly loose-lipped friends, which is not smart. And then we have Catherine's friends, right? Chapuis and one or two others who are so um, intent on being at Catherine's side ahead of her death that they are um, willing or seem to be willing to to do it, um, to make their way there, even in defiance of Henry, if that's what it takes, uh, which is not uh, the thing that one does if one is interested in self-preservation. But again, these people are, um, they seem to be less interested in self-preservation. They seem to be convinced that they can get away with doing and saying more um, more openly, more boldly, uh, more baldly than, uh, than they've done or said in the past. And because characters are wearing their hearts on their sleeves a bit more, testing their luck, we see events and allegiances turning on a dime, right? Niceties and civility um, are revealed to be, in some cases anyway, uh, dissembling artifice. Um, on page 122, we have a scene between Chapuis and Cromwell. And Chapuis is just taking his, uh, his criticism of Henry to a whole kind of new level. There, like, there's a fever to it that there hasn't been in the past, right? He's not being careful anymore when he's talking with Cromwell. Um, and then it says here, he, Cromwell, is amazed by the turn the conversation has taken. It is only 10 days since he enjoyed a genial supper with the ambassador, and Chapuis assured him that the emperor's only thought was for the realm's tranquility. There was no talk of blockades then, no talk of starving England. Eustace, he says, what has happened? Um, right. So again, he is amazed by the turn the conversation has taken. Right? Things were hunky-dory just a few days earlier, and now they feel less hunky-dory. Um, and he's not quite sure what has precipitated this. 
on page uh, 129, so this is um, in that scene, so just after Cromwell has essentially thrown the Duke up against the wall and uh, you know, trying to find out what the hell is going on, what are you talking about, what are you implying about Henry and Anne, Cromwell says, drag Wyatt into this and I'll kick you to China. The Duke's face is congested with rage. How has it come to this? Only weeks ago, Brandon was asking him to be godfather to the son he has with his new little wife. But now the Duke snarls. Get back to your abacus, Cromwell. You're only for fetching in money. When it comes to the affairs of nations, you cannot deal. You are a common man of no status. And the king himself says so. You are not fit to talk to princes. Right? How has it come to this? He says. And then, uh, you know, with Chapuis, he is amazed by the turn the conversation has taken. Um, we have characters, particularly Cromwell, who who feel like they know the lay of the land, who feel like they know what they can expect at any given turn, right? Things have been reasonably predictable. They know what they're getting into. They know how people are going to respond to things. And, um, and it feels like the rug has been pulled out from under Cromwell. Um, he has, again, he's gotten too comfortable with the idea of... Uh, who Chapuis is and what Chapuis wants, with who Suffolk is and what Suffolk wants. And they are showing him new sides to themselves. And they're showing him that um, that he is maybe unwise to to feel like he has his finger on the pulse of, um, of what they are going to do, say, or think in any given situation or at any given time. So basically, we have characters right now who seem to be looking to assert themselves, to position themselves uh, more authoritatively in the architecture of the drama as it unfolds. Passivity is gone, and even the Princess Elizabeth, Elizabeth is a forward child, uh, the Tudors are warriors from their cradle, uh, which is, again, one of those lines that makes one think about um, the Elizabeth of, you know, 22 years down the road when she, when she takes the throne and uh, reinvigorates England as as a nation and as a superpower. It's a pretty thrilling chapter because, um, you know, we have these characters who um, who now are uh, unafraid in ways that they haven't been in the past, and who are are willing to put themselves on the line to um, to see happen what they want to see happen. And that's an exciting development, um, especially given that. Um, you know, we have a king in this book who is um, more than willing to chop people's heads off at, uh, at any given moment. So can't wait to see in the second half of the novel, uh, you know, which characters uh, come to find out firsthand um, how far is too far. And uh, because there's, there's going to be some of that in this, in this story. So uh, for next weekend, we will be reading uh, just the next chapter in the book, which is called The Black Book. It's the first chapter in part two. Let me know in the comments below um, how you find the novel so far. And, uh, and I will see you guys again uh, very soon. Adios.